Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start off by thanking Derek Yellen and at the Limerick Scientific Committee for this tremendous honor of being invited to deliver the inaugural Lionel OP lecture. So as we're all aware, Lionel was a great icon and legend. And as South Africans, he was a tremendous inspiration and example to us of what is possible and what is achievable with a commitment and dedication to scientific rigor and academic excellence. One of the things I admired most about Lionel in the many years of watching him was his insistence and unyielding belief that before any data, information, evidence can be accepted and adopted as fact, needs to undergo independent, critical analysis. Now, with that in mind, the title of my talk is HIV is a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Is it time for Sub-Saharan Africa to change approach to CVD prevention in HIV? So what you have here is a map of the world showing the share of people with HIV who received antiretroviral therapy in 2017. And actually, it shows one of the great triumphs of healthcare in Sub-Saharan Africa, where despite major resource limitations, over 70% of the 25 million people who live with HIV were on antiretroviral therapy, remembering that three years later, this number is even higher. Now, this is important, of course, because HIV has been transformed by antiretroviral therapy from a near death sentence to a chronic disorder in which people can live healthy, dignified, and fulfilled lives. Now, as people with HIV live longer on their therapy, the proportion of death and disability that is non-AIDS related has grown. What you see on the left is a pie chart showing the frequency of serious non-AIDS events for people on antiretroviral therapy who are virally suppressed over time. And what you see is that cancer and cardiovascular disease make up close to 70% of these events. Now, this type of data has led to growing concern amongst HIV clinicians in Sub-Saharan Africa, where questions are being raised about the public health sector's readiness to deal with what might be an emerging threat to the cardiovascular health on the continent, with calls for a pivot in the current approach to adopt a much more aggressive approach to cardiovascular disease prevention and management. Now, if we step back for a second and look at what is the evidence for HIV as a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the bulk of it was summarized in this systematic review and meta-analysis published in the circulation by Shah and colleagues, in which they showed that the crude rate for incident cardiovascular disease is 60 per 10,000 patient rate, which makes it the same as other high-risk groups such as diabetes, that the pooled risk ratio for cardiovascular disease is around 2, that the disability-adjusted life years from HIV-associated cardiovascular disease was 1,800 per 100,000 persons. Now, I want to remind you that this is equivalent to other disorders like TB and stroke, stroke which are major killers and cause of disability in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that the population attributable fraction for HIV-associated cardiovascular disease was between 15 and 24% in most of Sub-Saharan Africa, where by comparison, it's less than 2% and less than 1% for much of the rest of the globe. Following the systematic review, the authors conclude our estimates have important policy implications for implementing appropriate cardiovascular disease risk gratification and treatment strategies across healthcare systems, especially where both HIV and cardiovascular disease are high. Now, some of the proposed new guidelines for this evaluation and management of cardiovascular risk in people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa or to assess all people for the presence of traditional cardiovascular risk factors, monitor bloods for lipid levels and evidence of dysglycemia at regular intervals, the use of scoring tools, uh, available scoring tools, and perhaps adding HIV as an independent risk factor, and having a very low threshold for the use of preventative statin therapy and or even a switch to more cardiometabolically friendly antiretroviral regimens. Now, whether the evidence, uh, available evidence to do this is robust enough to, for us to permit us to change approach and practice is not clear. 
Now, we need to remember that this is in the context of stretched healthcare infrastructure, competing health needs, competing social needs, and this uncertainty about whether or not the benefit is clear. So whether the evidence is robust enough to change approach and practice is not clear. This is in the context of stretched healthcare infrastructure, competing health needs, competing social needs, and uncertainty about the benefit. Now, reproducible and verifiable population health data in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa is very sparse, and in order to derive burden, risk, and prevalence estimates, global health bodies have used sophisticated models. However, where and when these estimates have been compared to locally derived data, the accuracy has frequently been poor. If we go back to that meta-analysis and systematic review, it's important to note that only one of the studies was from Sub-Saharan Africa, and in the study there were only 25 events, none of which were myocardial infarctions. And the rest of the data in the study is derived from these models from global disease uh, burden estimates. Now, where the prevalence and distribution of traditional risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease has been looked at, there's significant variation across the globe, and they're generally much lower across Sub-Saharan Africa. So these four maps show prevalence for smoking, dysglycemia and diabetes, dyslipidemia and elevated cholesterol, and smoking, and, what, and the age structure, sorry. And what you see is that for all of these, the risk in Sub-Saharan Africa is much lower. Now, where the correlation between actual burden of disease estimates with available data from prospective courts has been looked at, again, it's been very poor. A prime example of this is the Heart of Soweto study, which prospectively evaluated over 500 incident cardiac events in people living with HIV presenting to a large tertiary care center. And whereas the models would have predicted that over 20% of the events would be atherosclerotic disease related, only 2.7% of the events were found to be so. Another issue is that whether the myocardial events and coronary disease related events are related to predominantly atherosclerosis is not clear. Again, recent analysis of 30,000 patients uh, at a large network of integrated clinical systems in the United States suggests that over 50% of myocardial infarctions amongst people with HIV are actually type 2, i.e. related to supply demand and not type 1, related to plaque rapture and atherothrombosis, again with significance because of preventative and management implications. Another piece of evidence that challenges the idea that excess risk in patients with HIV is, is atherosclerosis related is, is in prospective cohorts of people living with HIV, the standardized risk ratio for myocardial infarction and CVD related death is highest only in the first year after antiretroviral therapy has commenced. And it tapers fairly rapidly such that it returns to the general population risk within two years. And finally, if you look at ways of risk evaluation and try to look at how standardized available scores fare in these populations, then you find that there are significant challenges with all of them performing very poorly and either overestimating or underestimating significantly. The implication of all of this is that the excess risk of CVD events is related to delays in commencement of antiretroviral and advanced HIV and may not be related to accelerated atherosclerosis, and that early diagnosis and aggressive early treatment of HIV uh, may to mitigate against this excess risk is what is desired. What we need are approaches based on available risk scores cannot be advocated. So what is the way forward? What we need uh, are in increased awareness of CVD in people living with HIV, better integration of NCD and HIV services to pick up those with cardiometabolic risk, promotion of healthy lifestyle with a focus on smoking, obesity, uh, healthy diet and exercise, while we await for more robust data and evidence. And in the meantime, the mainstay of cardiovascular disease, disease prevention may actually be earlier and better management of their HIV. Thank you for attention. Yeah.